star, ready for it? Will Chase, Chad Kimball, Julie Murney, Marcy Harriel, Mandy Gonzalez, Chuck Cooper, Terrence Mann, Julie Denau, Salkin, and Michael Potts. Crazy, crazy cast. Uh, this is the era of the jukebox musical and what'll be probably considered its heyday. Mama Mia had sunk in, and within a span of 18 months, Broadway got good vibrations, all shook out, times there are change in Jersey Boys and Lennon. Crazy. Uh, unlike other jukebox musicals, very different, Lennon used its songs to create a collage of John Lennon's life. Director Don Scardino said, we're singing the songs as him emotionally from his point of view. Many thought that this was one size fits all and simplified the legend, but the show aimed to say something very meaningful with parts of Lennon's story being told by women and men, people who were young and old, black and white. This really emphasized how different types of people had been inspired to live their lives by him. I loved it. John Lennon had written a lot of songs later in his life that reflected things he went through in his earlier years. For example, Instant Karma, about how much trouble John got into for saying the Beatles were bigger than Jesus, was used to punctuate this moment in the show. The idea originated with producer Edgar Lansbury, who had the opportunity to pitch a John Lennon musical to Yoko Ono. He asked Don Scardino, who he knew was a big Lennon fan, to come up with a concept. Uh, for those who don't know, Don Scardino was a brilliant Broadway actor in the 70s. He actually played Jesus in the original production of Godspell, and he also led underappreciated musicals like King of Hearts and Angel. Uh, we like to call him the Chad Kimball of his time. <laughs> True. Uh, Don is now a director, and he's actually the director behind 30 Rock. Uh, Edgar produced the original Godspell, so him and Don went back for decades and decades. And Lennon was done at the Broadhurst, where they had done Godspell together in the 70s. There is Mr. Don Scardino. So, um, everyone working on the show, uh, was, they were all huge John Lennon fans. They aimed to honor him. But audiences were big Lennon fans themselves, and, and they were very critical. Again, expectations. The show had a troubled San Francisco tryout. It was publicly known that Yoko was calling many of the shots, and Lennon was criticized for being too Yoko friendly. The creators went on the <laughs> Uh, the creators went on the record that they wanted to tell John's story, not the story of the Beatles, but audiences wanted to hear Beatles hits. Yeah, so you can see there's Will Chase with Yoko and Will Chase with Julie who played Yoko in the show. Uh, there were archival footage and real life quotes in the show, and the actors went into the audience to hand out things like daisies and stack the war cards. We have one of those in our living room. True story. Uh, critics found this kind of thing to be desperate. Uh, I remember the audience is quite eating it up, actually, um, except for like a couple of cynical, you know, New Yorkers in the front. Uh, but people really, I mean, this was very much like a get up and be part of a musical. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the whole show was, if you saw it, this had to be one of your favorite parts, there was one part where all the men in the show sat on the edge of the stage and they just sang Watch from the Wheels, and it was like nothing else was happening, it was very simple and lovely. Uh, so the music was very incredible, and the cast was just like top Broadway ensemble, clearly all these people. So uh, John and Yoko had actually begun writing an autobiographical musical about their lives in the late 70s, and it was going to be called The Ballad of John and Yoko. Two of the songs, India, India, and I Don't Want to Lose You, ended up in the show, along with songs like Give Peace a Chance, Power to the People, and Imagine. That's the ladies in the show with Will Chase photobombing. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, at first, all the actors took pretty equal turns playing Lennon, but as the show evolved, Will Chase ended up with a lot more material than the others. He looked the part, and he was even praised by Brantley for summoning John Lennon's qualities without impersonating him. The reviews slaughtered the show, um, although several had nice words for the cast. One critic said, Lennon is not the cold turkey you've read about. The cast is terrific and the music is great. Imagine there's no critics. It isn't hard to do. <laughs> no reason to shun the theater and no Tonys too. The show played to about half capacity most weeks and closed in a month. Uh, I was at the closing performance, of course, now we know, uh, and Don Scardino said about Lennon, I think we got what I was aiming for. We got his musicality, we got his politics, we got his humor, and we got his transformation. Time Out New York did not love Lennon, but they adored the moment in the second act that depicted the birth of Sean Lennon. They said, Julia Murney commemorates the occasion with the song Beautiful Boy. It's an enchanting arrangement, beautifully sung, which I savored every second of, as it possessed simple performance magic. Julia actually made her Broadway debut in Lennon in 2005, and here to speak about and sing from Lennon, Julia Murney. Good morning. What time is it? Unbelievable. And 
11 to Monday. Oh. It's the oddest thing to sit, to stand behind a curtain and have you talk about the show. It's very strange. Poor Lennon. Oh. <laughs> Every once in a while, someone will come up to me and be like, oh, I loved Lennon. And I always go, oh, you're the one. <laughs> uh, we had a good time. I don't know about everybody else, but we had a good time. Oh, look, see, there it is. Right there. There's John. Um, hi, what, what? Oh, sure. Oh, so Jennifer asked me for, for some slides. We're doing a slideshow, you ready? Here we go. I can't remember what I gave her. Oh, okay, so that was that was the very first photo shoot that we did. That's Marcy and Chad and Mandy and myself. And right after this, the day after this, I had to uh, become a bleach blonde for the show, which was um, traumatic. It took eight hours, and it, I kept it for a while because it took so long to make me blonde, but it never felt right. But I had to be blonde in the show because I played Cynthia Lennon at one point, who was his first wife, and she was blonde. And, but those were the, the few pictures that were caught. Oh, <laughs> that's in San Francisco. Those were our original costumes in San Francisco. We all wore the same, uh, these sort of base outfits, and then we put things on as we all became different people. These were um, really thick material, very awkward to wear, um, and uh, didn't fit. And I think the next picture might, yeah. <laughs> See, there's me being bleach blonde. And when you raise your hands, then you, your belly showed, and no one wanted that. And then when we got to New York, the, the whole concept changed, and we got to wear jeans. And I actually, I told Jennifer, this belt is the belt I wore in Lennon. I wore it tonight in honor of this. Um, but yeah, we just got to wear comfortable street clothes and not these strange things that make Julie laugh at me. Um, oh, this is opening night when Yoko uh, came up on stage, because she's Yoko, and, um, and, and saying, give peace a chance with us. And I, I do remember in that moment, <laughs> of all things, thinking, Yoko's very tiny. She's a teeny, teeny little woman. She's got quite a rack on her, though. <laughs> This is the quote that they dropped. The first big hit of the season has out Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia. <laughs> is that a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty much the best we got, so, you know. Oh, and that was at our, um, we did a photo shoot. This is back when we thought we were going to be a hit. Uh, <laughs> for uh, Newsweek. We did a, a photo shoot for Newsweek. and. Um, and that was fun, like we got our makeup done, it was some fancy photographer, we were in San Francisco at the time, and yeah, those are the boys. <laughs> and that's Darren, who is uh, the standby for the guys, who is like, this genius Beatles savant and knows everything, and I used to call him and our director Don Dungeons and Dragons, because they knew too much about the Beatles, it was, it was disturbing. We'd be like, hey, Darren, what color socks did Paul wear when they recorded Let It Be? He'd be like, he wasn't wearing socks. Like, too much. <laughs> You've gone too far, but he's a genius, genius musician. Okay, so this is, this is a series of pictures we did. This is called, What Happens When You Get, You Receive the Closing, closing Notice for Your Show. So, oh, let's see, we're kind of out of order. So, so on the, the top, Oh, it goes this way? Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is like, hmm? Oh, we're talking, oh, what's this? Oh, I don't know what you handed me over there. Oh, just, just hold on one second. I know, that's such a funny joke. It's so funny. Wait, I'm just gonna, just gonna read this thing. Do you have the rest of them? Do you have the next one? Oh, I'm gonna read this. Wait, what the hell is this? What the hell is this closing notice? What you, you know what? You can take your closing notice and you can suck it. And that because in, uh, on Broadway, even, like, even though the producers come and, and explain to you, you know, the, the, the notice is going up. There is actually a physical notice by, by law, by union law, that has to go up. And you're kind of like, really? Do you have to add insult to injury and have it be like, ooh, cool, ooh, cool? ooh? But you have to, and it's sort of sucky. Um, but is that, oh, okay. So <laughs> we were supposed to do the San Francisco out of town, and then we were supposed to go to Boston, and then come into New York. And then after San Francisco, with the costumes, and they decided to do a bit of an overhaul of the show. So we canceled Boston completely and came back to New York and rehearsed. And cut to, a year later, I'm touring as Elphaba in the Wicked Skit, and we go to Boston. And we're, um, we're, we're getting our tour of the theater, and they have all these posters from the shows that have been there, and in a staircase, hidden in a corner, <laughs> shiz shiz on. Uh, I took this 
picture and I sent it to the cast. And yeah, that's what went on there. Even the poster changed. Even that wasn't even the, the final artwork. Everything changed. It was very interesting, but that was mine. Yeah, see, that was the final artwork with John with the, with the rainbow glasses. And, um, and we used to, as, as they mentioned, we played to rather smallish houses. Um, and we used to, it was pretty casual. We used to do what we called the Lennon look, where one of us would just sort of peek out the curtain, and it would be like this. Oh, no, it's empty up there. Okay. Oh, there's some people down here. Great. <laughs> But it's, it's one of those weird things. We had such a good time doing the show, and, and there were people, like y'all, who were digging it. And we could feel them digging it. And it, it's, it's like this strange lesson that you learn, even like the kind of the biggest piece of shite you ever do. Somebody out there is digging it for reasons you don't know. And it's not for you to know. It's for them to enjoy. So you have to do it for them. You can't go on stage and be like, I know this sucks, you know this sucks, let's do it. You know, you gotta do it. And, and that's what, it's, it's, it's an odd trick, but it's truly, you know, in, in that way, doing a wicked is easy. Because everyone's like, you put my mom on a cherry picker and paint her green. They'd be like, it's the best show ever! <laughs> The night that it ended, um, uh, was this was right around the time that Hurricane Katrina occurred. And there was a huge benefit done that evening at the Gershwin Theater um, that was 18 hours long, I believe. Even longer than this. And, um, and I sang in it. And I got to stand on the stage of the Gershwin and sing this very sweet little song. And not very long after that, I was asked to do the show. And I actually do think that that was almost a part and parcel because they were all there and I knew them and I got it, whatever. But um, it all just keeps cycling around. And that's, those are the stories of Leonard. There are others, but I can't tell them in public with cameras. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know how to get arrested. But uh, yeah, so anything else? That was perfect. Okay. This is the song that I sang uh, in Act Two with um, with Chad Kimball's head in my lap and uh, Will Chase lying back on his on his elbows, looking at me with his little Will Chase face, and um, and uh, and the girls all around me. And it was it was one of those things where I it was such an open atmosphere of rehearsal. Don Scardino is the loveliest man you'd ever want to know, and. And this was one of those times where I said, because Chuck Cooper had said, I have this vision, he sang Instant Karma. And he was like, I had this, this vision last night in Instant Karma that we all did it in sign language. And sure enough, what we all shy on, we did it in sign language. That's why someone came in and taught it to us, and that's how we did it, because that's how Chuck saw it, and it was his number. And I had just this vision of everyone just sort of being around me, because it's this rather, it's a quiet, maternal moment. And that's what we did, and I loved it, because because my peeps were there, so this is beautiful gold. <laughs> 